On Saturday, September 1st, 2001, Lyndon LaRouche addressed an audience of more than 1,000 people at the annual Labor Day weekend conference of the Schiller Institute and International Caucus of Labor Committees in Northern Virginia. Last week, the LaRouche Connection presented the first hour of Mr. LaRouche's address, and we will now present the concluding 20 minutes of that speech. So what do you live for? Do you live like an animal to go out with a whimper? Or do you live like a human being knowing that you are doing something, you are developing in yourself, something which will be transmitted to future generations to make humanity better in the future? You no longer are a little person living in a little neighborhood with a little mind, with little ambitions and little interests you suddenly become a very big person because you have the minds of some of the greatest people in history before you live in you in your replication of what exactly their act of discovery you do things with pride to say he was right this was a great discovery we've got to use it for mankind's benefit you say I've got to do something to make the future better for those who come after us, and I can die with a smile on my face. Because I've lived well. I've lived at peace with the greatest people of the past, or at least some of them. And I can live at peace with joy in the people of the future. I will live forever in this process. That's what it is to be human. And when you think like that, and look at other people like that, you don't have problem. You may have problems, but that's fun. Because if problems force you to attack and solve problems, whether as an individual or in concert with others, that is fun. It's what the puppy does when the happy puppy is playing. The worst thing you can do to a puppy is not play with it. Make it angry. It gets bored. The worst thing you can do to a horse is not play with it, not work with it. They get bored, unhappy, may get sick and die on you. There's no purpose in life. Human beings have a different kind of play. It's that kind of play called cognition in respect to past and present, which makes an absolute moral difference, which defines the individual person as a creature made in the image of the creator. When you think in those terms, then you think accordingly. Now, how do we get out of this mess? I've defined implicitly what the problem is. The problem is we are gripped by a system, a doomed system, a self-doomed system. This system, this financial monetary system, with its legal trappings such as Scalia, with its uh, popular trappings such as popular opinion, this system, with this lack of sense of what humanity is, a lack of moral principle. There is no moral principle. If you, don't, if you don't have a sense of what humanity is, as I've described it, you have no morality. It's all mechanical. There's no morality in it. Morality involves passion. And passion, moral passion, is love for human beings. It's love for those cr who created people who went before you. It's love for those who are coming after it. To do nothing shameful in the eyes of those who came before you, even if you disagree with it. <laughs> and to do nothing which is not beneficial to the society that comes after it. No, in, in, with, in Plato called this agape. The apostle Paul referred to this repeatedly, as in 1 Corinthians 13, as agape. Don't get involved like, like uh, crazy Pat Robertson or, Jess, or Jerry Fall with these do's and don'ts, single issues. Forget the single issues. Don't marry about a list of do's and don'ts. Paul says the same thing. It's, this is fraud. Concentrate on agape, which is the essence of all morality. And when you have agape, you don't need any other code. 
except good judgment. Agape, essentially, is knowing what a human being is, knowing what humanity is, knowing what cognition is, and loving what you have received as benefits from the past, cognitively, and loving the future by giving to the future that which the future as human needs. And if you always act according to that, you may short, fall short in your understanding of what you need to do, but your intentions are always clear and moral. And that's what we lack, essentially. So we, that's the problem I face. I live in a society in which my generation was degenerate, became my degeneration. And my degeneration taught their children to degenerate still further. And now the thing is collapsing. And people are saying, oh, you've got to fix the system. You can't change the system. You've got to fix it. Don't talk about changing the system. Why don't you come up with some suggestion that will make the system work? It's like, you know, find a way to make strictly and enjoyable. <laughs> That's, that's the problem. What comes down to, we have a shortage of leaders. And this problem of leadership has two aspects to it. One aspect is people who are, who are qualified to be leaders. What's a qual person qualified to be a leader? A person who is essentially, for what I've said here, a person of agape. A person who has passion, who has love for humanity who wants to do good for future humanity, to honor the, the, the noble contributions of people from the past, and to give something better to the future. Those people are leaders, people who will not sell out the principle of agape for the sake of opinion or personal advantage, but will be not self-sacrifice. Huh? What they have done, in the United States in particular, what has been done to the American people, and I've only indicated the surface of this, the highlights of that, over the recent period. When I came out of service at the end of the war, just after, while Roosevelt's life was still in memory, living memory of many of us who served abroad, we shared the opinion, most of us, even some boys from the South, we shared the opinion that, as I would express it more articulately than most of them would at that time, but they shared it, that we had just come through a Second World War, which we were about to win. That was sure at that point. And the question was, when we, well, those of us who had served in Asia and saw the conditions of life in Asia, the oppression under colonialism of people in Asia, he said you cannot expect to go through two world wars and fight them with what these have meant and ignore the great injustice to the great masses of Asia and not expect to have a third world war come haunt you sometime down the, soon down the pike. We shared that view. We said as Americans, it is our job. I didn't know what Roosevelt's policies were at the time. I had a smell of them, but, but my, these were my policies and policies that I think most of the people who were in service with me at the time shared. We have to ensure that this ends, that colonialism and all its trappings ends. We have the power. We will come out of this war as the victors. We will have power in our hands. We can tell the world this colonialism, a colonialism is finished. And these nations, these new nations, are going to have the right, and with our assistance, to develop in the way we would want to develop, the way they choose, but with the same right. Within about 18 months of that time, probably 95% of the people I knew in service who had shared that view with me were on the other side, a gift of Trumanism. These were the people of my generation, the returning World War II veterans, 
Most of them sold out and were totally corrupt. I saw it. It stunk. I hated it. I saw my friends being self-destroyed. To see one destroyed is bad, but to see a person self-destroyed is the most horrible thing. These people became opportunists. They told their children, especially those in suburbia, be careful, be careful. The neighbors are watching. And the children became shallow-minded hypocrites who would get, on the one hand, from education, those who had better education, would get a sense of certain values were good and certain were bad. Certain things were fair, certain things were unfair. This, these kinds of positive values would occur. But they were very shallow. They didn't have a deep sense of morality. They didn't have a sense of putting your life on the line, if necessary, for a principle. You don't put your life on your line because you want to die. You put your life on the line because it's so important to you to defend and uphold a principle that you will not hesitate to risk your life to defend that principle. And that's what these little kiddos didn't get. And when they got hit, as others did, with the 1962 missile crisis, and then with the assassination of John Kennedy, most of the generation of the children of my generation went crazy. It was called the rock drug sex counterculture. You know what happened, the 68 of phenomena. As it occurred in the United States, as it occurred in Europe. These things happened. And I found myself more and more as we got into the 60s, middle 60s, standing alone. There was nobody there to lead, not really lead. People called themselves leaders, but they were all fake. And I found myself standing alone. And I just said, I got to do something. I must do something. So I did it. And some people in the room know or had some experience with what I did. Now, I was right. The first thing, I was a good economist then, a very good one, probably the best, at least on performance. You look at the past, look at what I forecast, what I taught. I was better than anybody I know today alive from that period or even today. I was the best. So I took my skills and knowledge, and I just intervened on campuses and began impromptu educating young people wherever I could find them. And out of that came a movement. I did some more forecasting. And I was right. I have never made a forecast which did not turn out exactly as I specified it. Never. I've been at forecasting actually for more than, now more than 40 years. I never made a mistake in that. Well, I was also careful. I didn't forecast, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Someone says, give me a prediction. I say, no, no, no. I'll give you the ones I have. <laughs> I don't make these things up you know, on demand. I'm not like a slot machine. You put a quarter in and get a, get a forecast out. <laughs> 71, the collapse. What happened in the late 60s? A series of monetary crises leading to a breakdown of the Bretton Woods system as it now existed unless the certain change were made. It happened exactly that way. 1967, the British pound sterling crisis. January, February, March, 1968, the dollar crisis. 1970, the Penn Central and, uh, uh, and Chrysler crisis. 1971, the collapse of the entire monetary system. 1975, a new wave of this. Then came the Carter administration, which destroyed all regulation to speak of, destroyed everything uh, infrastructure upon which this country was based. And we're suffering today because of a collapse of infrastructure which had been in progress for 30 years. For 30 years, the United States has had a negative investment in basic economic infrastructure, in transportation, in urban development, in power generation and, and distribution, in medical care, and so forth. We have been destroying ourselves 
as a nation over 30 years, culturally in every other way. And I found myself standing alone. I warned against Carter in a campaign I ran in 1976, and I was right. I warned against what Carter represented and what Bush represented in 1979, 1980, in that, that campaign, and I was right. I warned what was coming out of the degeneration of the Reagan administration in 1984 in the, in the presidential election campaign, which changed history in this country and in the world, and I was right. 1988, I forecast the, the immediately following collapse of the Soviet system and outlined what had to be done about that, and I was right. But I found myself, as you know, largely standing alone, surrounded by a few friends and a few friendly souls who would agree with me. It's a terrible resp responsibility to stand as I do at my age and to have these responsibilities. Because if I were to be taken, I don't know what would happen to the rest of you. And I'm not talking just about the United States, I'm talking about the world. Because in this United States, I know the institutions of the United States, at least enough, well enough to know what the story is. There isn't in the whole pack of political party leaderships, there is not the essential ingredient to save this nation. We have to inject it. And I, above all, have to inject it, which is why I'm running again. If I... I have many people in Western Europe that I admire. They're not the large percentage of people in Western Europe, but they're a substantial number. In Germany, in Italy, a few in France, huh? in Poland, in Hungary, in Czechia, Slovakia, the Balkans, so forth. They're good people. But they are not in the situation with the kind of leadership and knowledge necessary to put this back together again. Many of them are indispensable people in the sense that they represent an indispensable part of any combination which would put this thing into shape. But without my participation, they wouldn't make it. We have Asia, very good countries, very good people. But the Asian mind is not yet capable of dealing with a worldwide policy question. They deal rather with their relationship to the world in which they are embedded. And they're not stupid on that question. But they don't think in the right way to provide leadership for the world, to get out of this worldwide mess. South and Central America, well, it's the same process all over again. Leadership is essentially destroyed. The leadership that existed 20 years ago is no longer there. It's gone. Just a few aging people who remember. And that's the situation. Like a, one of the key leaders of Argentina is a man sitting in military prison can't find anybody else to lead. That's the situation. And therefore, it comes to the point, as now, that sometimes upon us falls the responsibility of leadership. It happens to all of us in some way or another, or many of us. Every physician will face that, because every sick person is a different person with a different disease, no matter what the diagnosis is. And the, the physician has to face the responsibility of dealing with that problem. A great teacher teaching a class of students faces the same thing about saving these young minds, a responsibility for saving them under these conditions today. It's a great, awesome responsibility. For some of us, the responsibility of the same singular variety comes in, the same, in a different way, each in a different way. But to all of us, one thing is in common. When destiny has given you a vocation and you have a mission, especially when you're the only one to play a key part in realizing that mission, you better accept it and do it. Thank you.
during an extensive question and answer period that took place following Mr. LaRouche's keynote address and continued on the following day during a lengthy afternoon session of the Schiller Institute ICLC conference. Mr. LaRouche was asked about the crisis in the Balkans and in an answer to a question from a prominent official in the American Macedonian community. LaRouche went into a discussion about not only the Balkan War crisis, but also the international irregular warfare threat that he warned was coming to the United States. He talked about the looming demonstrations outside the IMF and World Bank meeting at the end of September, several weeks from now. But he also warned that what the United States was facing was something far more ominous, something far more serious than the kinds of street Jacobinism that we saw in Genoa in July at the G8 meeting. LaRouche warned in a very uh, prescient and, in fact, eerie way that the United States was about to experience one of the greatest shocks in our nation's history. He did not say that on the basis of some kind of insider's foreknowledge about the plans underway for the attacks against the World Trade Center towers and against the Pentagon. He said that on the basis of a top-down understanding of the perilous strategic situation, of the danger of the global financial crash, and of the knowledge that there are those people within the extreme wings of the establishment in the West, in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere, who are active, aggressive, irrational proponents of the idea of a clash of civilization. There are some people, typified by Zbigniew Brzezinski, by Samuel Huntington, who believe that it is in the best interest of the United States to see the Middle East explode into a religious war that would spill over across the planet and engulf every nation in a conflict of the sort that we haven't seen in this world for centuries. And it was on the basis of concern that those people were running loose and that the Bush administration may be ill-prepared to combat it and may, in fact, be infiltrated by people who share those views with the Brzezinski's and Huntington's of the world, that he issued this warning about the strategic danger of an irregular warfare destabilization provocation against the United States. Precisely what LaRouche warned about occurred on September 11th, just 48 hours ago. We're still reeling from those events, but the only solution is to eradicate those elements from the policy-making establishment in this country, in Europe, and in other parts of the world who wish to play with billions of human lives and wish to plunge the world into a new dark age. This is an issue that we will be dealing with repeatedly over the coming weeks, so stay tuned to the LaRouche Connection. This is Jeff Steinberg. you can do to a puppy is not play with it. Make it angry. It gets bored. The worst thing you do to a horse is not play with it, not work with it. It gets bored. It's unhappy. It may get sick and die on you. It has no purpose in life. Human beings have a different kind of play. It's that kind of play called cognition in respect to past and present, which makes an absolute moral difference, which defines the individual person as a creature made in the image of the Creator. When you On Saturday, September 1st, 2001, Lyndon LaRouche addressed an audience of more than 1,000 people at the annual Labor Day weekend conference of the Schiller Institute and International Caucus of Labor Committees in Northern Virginia. Last week, the LaRouche Connection presented the first hour 
of Mr. LaRouche's address, and we will now present the concluding 20 minutes of that speech. So what do you live for? Do you live like an animal? To go out with a whimper? I will live forever in this process. That's what it is to be human. And when you think like that, and look at other people like that, you don't have a problem. You may have problems, but that's fun. Because if problems force you to attack and solve problems, whether as an individual or in concert with others, that is fun. It's what the puppy does when the happy puppy is playing. The worst thing, or you live like a human being knowing that you are doing something. You are developing in yourself something which will be transmitted to future generations to make humanity better in the future. You no longer are a little person living in a little neighborhood with a little mind, with little ambitions and little interests. You suddenly become a very big person because you have the minds of some of the greatest people in history before you live in you and your replication of what exactly their act of discovery. You do things with pride to say, he was right. This was a great discovery. We've got to use it for mankind's benefit. You say, I've got to do something to make the future better for those who come after us. And I can die with a smile on my face because I've lived well. I've lived at peace with the greatest people of the past, or at least some of them. And I can live at peace with joy in the people of the future.